live on the channel, so that is awesome. And uh, I know this is confusing for folks because uh, folks might be waiting on the other channel to be able to uh, connect with me right now. So if you guys are seeing this, come on over here. And we're going to do our little AMA session today for 30 minutes to kind of take everybody through their most important questions. So let's start with the basics a little bit, because I know a lot of you guys ask questions regarding specifics on your personal needs. So one of you asked the questions regarding SGLT2s, and SGLT2 stands for sodium glucose transporter inhibitor. So the idea behind SGLT2s is the data shows that they can actually be very, very helpful in kidney disease, they can be very helpful in diabetes, and they can also be very helpful in heart disease. And when we start to talk about those things, what's important to remember is, is your nephrologist, your kidney specialist might tell you to start on an SGLT2 if you have protein that's spilling in the urine. So if you have a lot of protein you're spilling, SGLT2s are a great add-on on top of existing medications. So for example, if you're already on medications like an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, SGLT2 inhibitors can be a very beneficial add-on because they work completely different from standard medications. So what you'll tend to find is as you start to use the SGLT2s in addition to ACE and ARBs, you'll have tremendous benefits. Now, here's a downside. All drugs have side effects and interactions. And so when people start on an SGLT2, they might notice that their kidney function may look like it's getting a little bit worse. Don't be alarmed. As long as we're maintaining hydration, we're watching you carefully, you will be okay. The big stuff to note is this. With SGLT2s, probably the best example I can give you is almost like if you were on a ketogenic diet. So SGLT2s will make you pee out sugar. So they're getting rid of the sugar from your body. Now, the problem with this is if you are susceptible to urine infections, urinary tract infections, then this can create a situation where you can have a lot of infections that end up showing up. And that's where the concern lies. Now, what kind of infections? They can be bacterial or they can be fungal infections. And then for those of you guys joining us, so sorry about the other link, wasn't working right. I see people are transferring over. Go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And today is what we call an AMA session or, you know, ask me anything and we'll go ahead and answer it. So the first question that we were talking about was specifically around uh, one of our, our viewers said, look, you know, my nephrologist wants to put me on an SGLT2. Should I start? The answer is yes. It will make a difference in protecting your overall kidney. You just have to be careful that you're on something that's going to make you pee out sugar. So if you're susceptible to infections, talk to your doctor. Now, another question that comes up a lot is regarding blood pressure. And so one of the viewers had asked the question regarding being able to control blood pressure. And so when it comes to things like blood pressure, what you want to know is that a few things. First is when it comes to picking a medication, it doesn't really matter what medication you're picking specifically for blood pressure. What matters is we're targeting a very aggressive type of blood pressure. So in other words, back in the day when I first started training, we used to talk about a number of 140 over 90. And if you were over that, you were hypertensive. Now, if you're over 130, you're considered to have high blood pressure. And we want to make sure that we bring you down from there. So in terms of blood pressure control, the type of medication is not as important as the final number. But as always, there's a caveat. And so if you're wondering, what is the caveat to this? Well, the caveat really is, is what if you have protein in the urine? Then the best medication would be like an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, for example, lysinopril, all the prills are ACE inhibitor, or like losartan, telmosartan, herbisartan, those are ARBs. And the reason we say that is because now you not only want to control the blood pressure, you want to control the protein in the urine. Let's say you have cardiac issues. Then in that case, you may benefit from having a beta blocker because the beta blocker will help your blood pressure, but will also help your heart. So for example, on all of these blood pressure things, you want to make sure that you understand blood pressure is the priority. 
if you have a secondary indication, then we may give you some more specific choices, but otherwise, no, it's always the same. Okay, uh, Sylvia asked a question about astralagus. I'm actually going to be doing an entire episode on that. So hold that thought. There isn't a lot of good data to be supportive. So let me get back to you with the whole talk, and this way you guys can see it. Uh, Peter asked the question, what is the correct amount of protein for stage three? So Peter, this is a great question. There is no quote unquote correct. What you're looking for is less than 30 on the microalbumin to creatinine ratio. That's what you're going for. That's considered normal. So in other words, less than 30. And then if you're talking about overt protein in the urine, meaning all types of protein, you're looking at less than 300 to be normal. Now, what the bottom line on that for you, Peter, to take home is, is you want to have the least amount of protein in the urine as possible. So when we have kidney patients with kidney disease and they come to us and they say, look, doc, you know, what is my target? I'm spilling 2,000 milligrams of protein in the urine. Let's say you are stage three. I'm spilling 2,000. What should my target be? Well, we consider success if we are able to lower your protein in the urine down to less than 1,000 and ideally less than 500, given the fact that normal would be less than 300. So even though we are not quite at less than 300, less than 500 is amazing. And the goal is 50% reduction or get you down to less than 1,000. So just remember, the correct amount of protein is the lowest amount possible. Um, Din asked the question, she said, hi doc, if any uh, one was on a trial drug for IG nephropathy, after one year, they were told that the drug was a placebo, not the actual drug. Meantime, the protein went up. What would you suggest? So, Din, this is an excellent question. When it comes to IgA nephropathy, we have lots of wonderful treatments, just like for any condition where you're spilling protein in the urine. And remember, we've actually done an episode on IgA, so I would definitely look at it. But just in terms of the basics, the basics is you got to get the blood pressure control, you got to get the weight control, and if there's any sugar issues, you got to get that under control. Then you want to be able to use medications like ACE inhibitors or ARBs, those would be lisinopril, losartans, uh, any type of pills, and ramipril, etc. any type of pills. So you want to be able to use the ACE inhibitors or ARBs, those are the main blood pressure control and lower the protein. Then there's other data that supports the idea of SGLT2s because those can be very helpful in lowering the protein in the urine. The bottom line with medications is now we have so many different options. And then on top of all of those options, we talk about things like sometimes we use steroids on people. Sometimes we use immunosuppressive agents like Celset or Tacrolimus, etc. And those are really important personal decisions to be able to use with your nephrologist so that we look at the risks and the benefits and come up with the right decision for you. So in other words, if you have more protein in the urine, please don't lose hope. We have so many options for IgA. And as you know, IgA progresses very, very slowly. So if you have it, don't lose hope. There's lots of options there. Tiffany asked the question, does osteoporosis medication affect the kidneys? So Tiffany, the answer to that question is no. Osteoporosis medications don't, but what happens is, is if your kidney function is low, specifically a kidney function or GFR less than 30, we don't want you to take it because there can be some very rare but very serious side effects. And that's why we make sure that you're not taking it if your kidney function is low because a lot of those medications are cleared by the kidneys. Um, Dennis asked the question, said Concerta or Abilify cause overactive bladder syndrome. So I'm not aware of a direct link. Let me go ahead and go and look it up because I don't want to give you or stray you in the wrong direction and I'll get back to you on it. But not from the top of my head that I'm aware of it. But overactive bladder, there's a number of things that can cause it. So depending on what the underlying diagnosis is, we do need to look at that. And then Sylvia said protein is 90 grams daily. Uh, so protein generally is 90 grams wouldn't be the number, Sylvia. It would be more like milligrams. Or are you saying that 
your protein intake, in other words, what you're eating is 90 grams versus what you're spilling. If you're asking what you're eating is 90 grams, then generally speaking, if you have kidney disease, there's a couple of important points, two specifically. The first one is, is plant-based proteins have less impact on the overall body. So when it comes to gut bacteria, you're going to find that plant-based proteins are actually more beneficial to gut-based bacteria. They're going to generate less uremic toxins. And we know from a kidney overall disease perspective, the disease decline is less with plant-based proteins versus animal-based proteins. Number two is the amount of protein that you take in also matters. So in other words, what we aim for is 0.6 to 0.8 grams per kilogram of body weight. So whatever your body weight is in pounds, just Google it, go to google.com, look at the calculator to convert to grams to kilograms, and you'll get that a pound is 2.2 kilos. So you can go ahead and figure out um, the number as far as that goes. And so you have that answer. In terms of fish, so is fish considered, so 170, uh, Sylvia, just to follow up, so your weight is 170, divide that by 2.2 to get your weight in kilograms. Multiply that weight in, so 170, and I don't have a calculator handy in front of me, but if you take the 170, divide that number by 2.2, you'll find out how many kilos you are. Take that number in kilograms and multiply it by 0 0.8. That will tell you how much protein you can have per day. And that's a good way to be able to have an idea. And let's take a look here. So Din asked the question, is fish considered an animal protein? So Din, fish is an animal protein in that sense, but, but, and this is very, very important because people confuse this, not all animal proteins are the same. So red meat is the worst. Fish is neutral to beneficial. So this is important to remember, fish is unique, egg whites are unique in that sense that the acidity is very, very low. And so therefore, for fish and for egg whites, the acid level tends to be very low. So if you're somebody who's not vegan, etc., then yeah, those are definitely okay. If you're somebody who's plant-based, etc., then you're looking at more plant-based sources, but either one, that's okay. Uh, Vincent said 250 pounds, lost 30 pounds. I take Ozempic because I'm a diabetic. So a few things, Vincent, you want to know about Ozempic and you want to understand about your weight loss journey. First, incredibly, incredibly proud of you. Any weight loss that you lose is amazing. But here's what you want to know about Ozempic that sometimes isn't talked about as much. There's pros and there's cons. Pros are you can lose weight up to 15%. That's what the studies show. Now, some people who do, you know, diet and exercise with it and are very regular, they will lose more than the 15%. But there's a dark side. So what is it? As you know, there's been a lot of controversy because rare side effects are important to understand. One of them is the way Ozempic works is when you eat, it delays how food leaves your stomach. So we call that delayed gastric, meaning stomach, delayed gastric empty. But in some people it's actually stopped their stomachs from moving altogether. Very rare side effect, but you got to know that's permanent. And after you stop the drug, it didn't come back. The second thing is in animal studies, there was a small risk of thyroid cancer. Have not seen that in humans, but don't know yet because sometimes cancer, after you have exposure, can take anywhere between months to years. And so generally speaking, you want to wait for five to 10 years to see what the impact of that drug is. And then the third part of this that ends up happening is, is that we talk about things on your mood. Now, the FDA is looking into the reports that patients have talked about complaints around risk of depression and suicide. So please, if you're taking this and you know your mood is being affected, be very, very careful about that aspect because it can impact your mood. Now, if you take Ozempic, what you got to realize is, if you do do it, make this the last diet you ever do in your life. In other words, rely on habits. Don't just take Ozempic and let Ozempic do all the work. How many calories are you eating? Track it. Are you making sure that you're cutting down on artificial sweeteners? Are you making sure that you're not drinking your calories? 
minimizing sodas, minimizing juices, minimizing alcohol, even minimizing protein shakes and smoothies because it's better to chew your food than to drink your food. If you're not a diabetic, then it's important to stop eating around four hours before bedtime so you get that deep restful sleep at night. Another thing to remember is if you're not sleeping at least seven hours a night, the data shows it's really six quality hours. So when I say seven, I'm saying when people sleep, they toss and turn. So it's six quality hours. When you sleep less than that, the next day, your cravings for salt, for sugar, and for fat go up, not down. So sleep is a secret weapon. And then the last thing to remember about Ozempic or drugs like Ozempic is there's some data that says when it comes to lean body mass or muscle mass, it can cause as much as up to, not all, up to 40% muscle mass loss. So when you talk about muscle, you want to make sure that you're at least going to the gym and doing resistance training two to three times per week. That is really important because if you're not and you lose muscle, it's very hard to get muscle back, especially if you're over the age of 40. So make sure that you're remembering all of that. And if you use a Zempic, work with a professional that knows and has experience with it so that they can take you through that journey. There's a lot of hype around Ozempic and drugs like Ozempic, and they work really well. As you know, in my obesity practice, I prescribe all of those drugs, and I have tremendous success stories. But with every patient, I make sure they realize that Ozempic is just a tool in their tool bag. You still have to get your lifestyle. In other words, you got to get your house in order. All right, looking over here, let's see, AAAA <laughs> asked the question, is fasting calorie deficit the quickest way to drop weight? So here's the thing. You have to do a calorie deficit. When they look at diets, compare plant-based to keto, to paleo, to low-carb, at the end of 12 months, they find that there's not a whole lot of difference in terms of weight loss. So what we tell patients is don't aim just for weight loss. Aim for better health. So that's why diets like plant-based, or Mediterranean, which is essentially a plant-based diet, which allows you for a little bit more fish and some other choices, so it's more flexible. But at its base, it's fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, etc. So when we talk about deficits and losing weight fast, I don't recommend rapid weight loss. Anytime you lose weight fast, your brain says, oh my God, we might be in trouble. We might be dying. So it pulls you back. It does everything it can to make you gain the weight back. So a lot of patients lose weight fast. They gain it fast also. And that's why we are not fans of rapid weight loss. We like slow and steady. So ideally, about a pound a week, if you do that, data shows you're more likely to sustain it long term. This is why when you look at shows like The Biggest Loser, that TV show, when they looked at them several years later, all of them gained the weight back. And when we have patients who do liquid calories, meaning they drink their liquids and they lose a bunch of weight, the second they go back to solids, they gain it back. Slow and steady does, does, does win the race. All right. Uh, Din said, there are many talks on stem cells. What are your thoughts? So, Din, this is the, the greatest promise out there was stem cells. And we're still waiting to see that with kidney disease. And there's a lot of unscrupulous characters out there who are injecting stem cells into the kidney, promising all sorts of things, and taking people's hard-earned dollars. The problem is I don't have any data to show that stem cells actually work in kidney disease. Right now, the biggest thing we're waiting for is the quote-unquote artificial kidney, so we can start using that. And we still don't have that yet. But stem cells hold a lot of data behind them, a lot of hype. I hope that they come true and they're able to help. 